Well, today we begin a new series entitled The Missing Peace. And today I want to speak to you on the subject of, is peace even possible? Is peace even possible? You know, moments of peace are precious. And when we find them, we hold on tight to them. And of course, we pray that they will last. But the Bible speaks about a peace that goes beyond understanding. In other words, there is a peace beyond the pain, the fear that we face today. And if you've been missing peace, I pray that you would discover it with us this Christmas season in the month of December and that it would follow you all the days of your life, the peace of God. Well, as I said earlier, you know, it, uh, I had a birthday on, on Wednesday. And you know, as, when you're a kid, you have a birthday. But as you get older, you have a birth week, a birth month. Amen. You celebrate it all week or all month. In other words, you milk it for all you can. Can I hear a good amen to that? So I celebrated a birthday on November 30th, 1956. There I am, a year old, right there. Someone told me, hey, you shouldn't be putting naked pictures of yourself up there. But that is the youngest picture that I have of myself. I was a year old at, at that point. Grew up in Arizona. We were always in diapers. And it wasn't pampers. It was diapers. But honestly, most of the time, we were naked. That's just the way it was back then. You know, one of the traditions that we do for our birthdays is that we get a cake. And of course, we get candles, Right. And it's, been a, it's a tradition that's been around for a very long time. And usually uh, there's a candle for each year. It's put on the cake. Of course, I turned 66. I cannot imagine a cake big enough to handle 66 candles. But also, if there was, they'd probably need a couple of fire extinguishers because who knows what would happen with 66 candles. You know, but this tradition of candles, I was wondering, why, why do we put candles on a cake? And I did a little research, and this tradition can be traced back to the ancient Greeks. In other words, they often burn candles as offerings to their many gods and goddesses. And not only the Greeks, but long before the Greeks, many of the, the old civilizations. But for the ancient Greeks, putting candles on a cake was a special way to pay tribute to the Greek moon goddess Artemis. And uh, they would bake round cakes to symbolize the moon. And then they would put a candle that represented the reflection of the, of the moonlight. And later on, that tradition sort of took off. And after Christ in Germany... Uh, the Germans did the same thing. For religious reasons, Germans would make a round cake and also they would place a large candle in the center of the cake to symbolize the light of life. In other words, there came a day where you were given life. The, the light of your life came on. And uh, since then, we've been putting candles on our cakes. For some cultures, they believe that the smoke from the candles carry their wishes and their prayers to the gods who lived in the skies. And others believe that smoke helped ward off uh, evil spirits. But today it's still very popular to put uh, birthday candles on cakes and, and, and many people still believe, you know, I don't know if you know this, but they'll say, hey, you, you got to make a wish. And of course, the idea is if you blow off all the candles, your wish will come true. If you don't blow out all the candles, your wish will not come true. And uh, some people still hold to that. But uh, you say, well, Pastor, why, why are you telling me all of that? I'm telling you all of that for this reason, birthday wishes. You know, one of the things that they'll tell you, make a wish. And I thought about that as I was preparing for the message today. And, you know, I want to ask you, if you could wish for anything that you would have, anything that you could pray for and it would come true or wish for, what would you wish for? You know, some people would say, well, Pastor, I, I, I wish I would win the lottery and I wish I would get a lot of money. And that's what you wish for. By the way, that's not a terrible thing. But how many of you know that, you know, money doesn't bring happiness? Now, you hear that from poor people. But listen, if you listen, the rich people will tell you the same thing doesn't bring happiness. It's not the best wish. One lady was asked, what would you wish for? She was single. She said, well, I would want a husband. Or, or the guy would say, I would want a bride. You know, as I told you, my, I celebrated an anniversary uh, on the 15th, 47 years of life. Amen. And uh, I have a beautiful wife. Look at how beautiful she is. She's still beautiful. Amen. So some people say, I, I wish I'd be married. Some people pray and say, well, I wish I wasn't married anymore. But, you know, people wish for a lot of different stuff. Some people say, you know what, I wish I was more beautiful. They wish for beauty. Some people say, my wish is for happiness. Some people say, I, I, my, my wish is for health. Some people say, I, I, I would want fame. The one that I like, when people are asked, what wish would you make? They say, I would wish for more wishes. That's what I would want, wishes that would come true. But listen, here, here's what I want you to know. It's Christmas season. And when the angels came to announce the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, they said, and Luke 2, verse 14 records this. It says, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. You know, when Jesus would talk to people, Jesus would greet the people and he would say to them, peace be with you. Or after something happened, something even tragic happened, 
He would tell the people, go in peace. You know, Paul, when he wrote the letters, and he writes most of the letters in the New Testament, the books in the New Testament, he starts him off by this phrase, grace and peace be with you. You know, Paul could have said grace and popularity be with you because a lot of people want popularity. He could have said grace and power or grace and riches or or grace and faith, but he didn't. What he said was grace and peace be with you. I suggest to you on this morning that what so many people really want in life is they want peace. They want real peace. You know, I talk to people, and when we get down to the nitty-gritty of what's happening in their life, they'll say, you know, Vic, what I really want is I want peace, a peace that's been elusive, a peace that I haven't been able to find. And what they want is that they want a divine peace that only God can give. Because I don't know if you know this or not, but you can have a lot of money in the bank and have no peace in your heart. You can be successful on the outside, but be empty on the inside. You can be married and have no peace in your marriage or in your home. So what I have found is that so many people, what they want is that they want peace. But we don't have peace today. What we see a lot is we see the opposite. There's a lot of tension. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of anxiety, apprehension going on today. You say, well, what are we so anxious about? We're anxious about our relationships, our families, our friends, our finances. You know, and then you add to that that in this life, we have a lot of misunderstandings. We have disagreements. There's a lot of hurt feelings. There's a lot of bitterness. There's a lot of unforgiveness that roams today in the land. And so what so many people said is, you know what, I really need peace in this life. How how do I overcome that? And and I want to ask the question, and that's the title of our message, is this even possible? Is it possible to experience peace, any kind of peace? But before I go further, I want to pray with you. Would you bow your heads and let us pray? Father, thank you for everyone here this morning and every person watching online. Lord, we live in a very complicated time. And Lord, this season, there's a lot of pain. There's a lot of loss. There's a lot of tension. There's a lot of fear. So Father, we do what your word says. We cast our cares on you. And we pray that you would open the windows of heaven. And you would pour out a peace upon your people. That goes beyond our human ability to understand. God, may your word and your spirit bring peace and comfort today. May we experience the peace of God. And Father, we pray, we ask you this. In the name of your precious Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen, amen. You know, the, the, the topic of peace appears throughout the Bible. In the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah, who was a, a prophet, he was a pastor, who ministered during the time, ministered to Israel during a time very similar to our days. There was a time of fear, unsettledness, uncertainty. And God one day speaks to Isaiah and he says, this is what I want you to tell my people. And Isaiah gets a message from God. And the message was, it spoke about a day filled with peace and the goodness of God. And in Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 1, notice what he writes. He says this, In that day, everyone in the land of Judah will sing this song. Our city is strong. We are surrounded by the walls of God's salvation. Open the gates to all who are righteous. Allow the faithful to enter. Isaiah speaks of God as being with his people, providing salvation and security. He likens God to a wall that surrounds and protects his people. Look at verse 3. He says, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Trust in the Lord always, for the Lord is the eternal rock. In other words, Isaiah makes a promise, a promise that I believe is for us today. It is the same promise that Jesus made when he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you to the ends of the earth. I will be with you in the midst of all situations and all circumstances, in the midst of all the seasons of your life. It's the same promise, a promise made to them. It's a promise. And I want that promise. I need that promise. I I want the peace of God. I want God's presence in my life more than ever before. The problem today is that today we experience, it seems that we experience not peace, but we experience the opposite of peace. You know what? Inconsistent peace at best, imperfect peace. Here's what I have found. I have found that I can have peace one moment and even pray to God and trust God uh, for something and, and be fine for about five minutes. And then suddenly I'm saying, God, why haven't you done something about it? God, why don't you care? God, where are you at? Lord, why are you allowing this? And all of a sudden, a, a moment of peace turns into a moment of tension and anxiety. You know, I, I found that even true with joy. I can have moments of joy, moments of tranquility, and I can sense the presence of God. And just moments later, I can be overcome with the sense of fear and anxiety and insecurity. And I say, God, why? Well, God's promise is peace. 
The Bible says that you and I can have a peace that is a perfect peace from God. Now, some of you might ask, what is perfect peace? By the way, the word peace in the Old Testament is the word shalom. Actually, when you go to Israel, that's how they greet you. It is the greeting when they say hi to you and they say bye to you. Shalom or shalom, we'll see you later. And it's a wonderful word that's more than peace. It means more than just peace. It means wholeness. It means completeness. It actually is the fulfillment, the the fullness of peace. It's, It's peace in every single way possible. It's complete. It's perfect peace. And this perfect peace is the peace that God offers you and me. It's the peace that is possible. Is peace possible today? Absolutely. But it comes from God. You know, we're living that I don't think we're ever going to know world peace. As a matter of fact, let me tell you what I believe. The Bible teaches that as the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ gets closer, there will be more wars and rumors of wars. Things will get uglier and worse. God never uh, promised world peace. What he promised was inner peace, peace that you could experience. And you say, well, Pastor Victor, what does that peace look like? Well, first of all, peace with God. You can have peace with God. Many people don't have peace with God. And you say, well, Pastor, how do you know? Well, I'll tell you how I know there's a lot of people that feel God is mad at them. There's a lot of people that don't have confidence in their relationship with God. As a matter of fact, they don't feel comfortable praying to God about what's going on in their lives. Why? Because they don't feel God really cares. They don't feel, you know what, they feel God is mad at them. God is against them. People who don't have peace with God don't know where they stand with God. And as a result, if you had peace with God, you would know where you stand with God. They're not sure whether he really loves them or they don't know if maybe I've I blown it so much, messed up so much that God doesn't want anything to do with me. Maybe I've gone too far, you know, I have a lot of shame, I have a lot of guilt. Am I, you know, I'm beyond the point of no return. And those people never know the peace of God. And they don't know the peace of God because they never have accepted the Prince of Peace, which is Jesus Christ. And when he comes into your life, one of the first things that happens is you experience the peace of God, the forgiveness of God, the love of God. You're aware that God, you matter to God. God cares about you. There will be no doubt. If there's any doubt that you're at peace with God, it's because you don't know God. You don't have a relationship with God. The other thing that, that uh, the peace that God offers, not only a peace with God, but a peace with other people. You know, there's a lot of people that are not at peace with others. You know, I, I find it interesting. There are people that are always on the war path. I, you know what? There are Christians that their spiritual gift is war. Amen. They love to be warring with people. Now, some of you say, well, Pastor, you don't know my family. You don't know the people that I deal with. I do because I deal with them too. Amen. And, and God understands. God knows that sometimes this peace is hard. That's why the Bible says in Romans, it says, you know what? And, and as much as is possible with you, be at peace with all people. In other words, God knows sometimes it's impossible. As much as you try, there are some people that are just hard. It's very difficult to have peace with them. But as much as is possible, but one of the things that God offers, he offers you peace with others. You can be at peace. You know what? Honestly, I have no enemies. I mean, there might be people that don't like me and see me as an enemy, but I have no enemies. Amen. The world thinks we pastors are their enemies. We're the problem today. And you know what? I don't, I don't think so. So peace with God, peace with others. And you know, he also offers a peace with yourself, within yourself. You know, those things in the past that you're ashamed of, the things that you did that you wish you hadn't done. You know what? There is a peace. You can have peace with yourself. You know what? You can have peace in the midst of the circumstances, even when your circumstances are on what, what, what you want them to be. He offers shalom. It's complete peace from God. You know, I love Isaiah 20, that, that verse that I read to you in the original Greek, because it says, you know, God's peace will be with you. But in the original Hebrew, it says, shalom, shalom. The word appears twice. In other words, it's emphatic in the Hebrew language. It it, it says, you're going to get a double portion of peace. In other words, God says, I'll give your your portion of peace, and I'll give you an even more extra. It's perfect peace. It's a peace that goes beyond our human ability to understand. Paul captures that thought when he writes to the Philippians in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, and he says, then you will experience God's peace which exceeds anything we can understand. And his peace will guard your heart and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. You know, the goal of the Christian is to guard our hearts and our minds. And you know why? Because it'll keep us in peace. Now, let me be very clear about something. Peace doesn't mean you won't have trouble in your life or there won't be troubles in this world. You know, some people say, well, Pastor, I became a Christian and I I was led to believe that everything was going to be beautiful and wonderful. No more problems, no more troubles. And uh, and I would always have peace, but there are times I have no peace. What's going on? Well, what's going on is somebody lied to you. 
Now, Jesus said in the Gospel of John, chapter 16, verse 33, he said, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and many sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. In other words, when you came to Christ, he settled the sin situation in your life. You know what? He, he gave you a heart responsive to God. Spiritually, you're transformed. But still, we deal in it with an evil, sinful world. And sometimes, it causes trouble and sorrows and difficulties. So listen, when we talk about God's peace, it doesn't mean you won't have problems. It doesn't mean nothing ever is going to go wrong. It doesn't mean your kids are, are never going to fight on the, on, in the car on the way to church. It doesn't mean that your, your spouse isn't going to get on your last nerve. It doesn't mean you're not going to have problems with your co-worker. Yeah, you are. But in the midst of that, the Bible says, God says you can have peace. See, peace doesn't mean you're not going to have a difficult time. So what is shalom, shalom? Well, shalom, shalom is a perfect peace of God, and he offers it to us. Now, you need to understand that peace isn't found in the absence of problems. Well, Pastor, what I need is no problems. No, it's not going to happen. His peace is found in the presence of God. Amen. It's shalom, shalom. It's peace in God's presence. Listen, I want you to know that even when life is anything but what you want it to be, His peace still can be there. Now, some of you right now may be pushing back a little and saying, Pastor Vic, you know what? You don't understand. It seems to be you have a, a great marriage. It seems you have a beautiful family. It seems everything's going good with you. You know what? And I can understand. But my marriage stinks right now. Where is there peace in that? You know what? I'm riddled. My body is riddled with disease. The doctor gave me some terrible news. Where's the peace in that? I have a son. I have kids at home that are drug addicts. You know what? I have a problem in my home with pornography. People using porno seeing pornography. Where is the peace in that? It's Christmas time, and financially, my finances are upside down, and I can't do anything for my family. And you talk about peace. Where's peace in that? You know, and on and on. My spouse is being unfaithful to me. How can I have peace in that? Well, the Bible says you can. You can have the peace of God. Shalom, shalom. So the question is, how do you experience the shalom, shalom of God? How does that happen? How does it come? A lot of people think, well, once I become a Christian, all of a sudden, it just comes over me. Poof, poof, and I mellow out. You know what? And all that anger is gone and all that, you know, frustration and all the tension and all the problems are gone and everything's hunky-dory. That's just what, it just, poof, happens to me. You know, he does give you peace, but there's a little, little bit more complicated than that. I want you to notice, and if you're taking notes, first of all, if you want to experience the peace of God, here's the first thing you need to know. First of all, the battle of peace begins in our minds. It begins in your mind. There's a war in your mind. It's amazing how, how you can know the truth of God, but then my mind wanders into all sorts of untruths. Amen? You know what? There's a war going on in my mind between what God says and what my mind tends to wrongly believe based on the input that I get from social media, from the world, from the friends, from my experiences, from my circumstances. And, and that's why the Bible says the battle for peace begins here in your mind. Notice what Isaiah said in 26 verse 3. Let me read it to you again. You will keep perfect peace, all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Notice, the peace is for those that are focused and fixed on God. I like what the NIV says, the version, it says, you will keep in perfect peace those who minds are steadfast. You know, the word steadfast means anchored in God. It means unshakable. That's what it means. You know what, you got to be anchored in God in every Isaiah says you can have perfect peace if your thoughts are fixed on God. He doesn't say you'll have perfect peace when your mind is fixed on CNN. Some of you watch too much CNN or too much Fox News. Or you worry too much about your financial problems. Or, or he doesn't say you'll have perfect peace when your mind is focused on the bad news that you get from your doctor. No, you'll have perfect peace when your mind is fixed and focused on the truth of God. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. You know, I love, I love that Hebrew word fix. It's a, it's a Hebrew word, shamach. And it actually means to lean on completely. It means to rest fully on God. In other words, the Bible says that those who trust, who rest, you know what, who lean on God. Are you leaning on God? Literally, you will have perfect peace when you lean completely or when your mind is resting on God and God's promises. So my question for you is, what's your mind fixed on? What do you think a lot about? You know, what do you focus? What consumes your mind, especially when it comes to this issue of peace? Some of you are saying, well, Pastor, financial issues. You know what? Right now, my mind is fixed on the, the political division. 
You know what is going on in our country, in our family. I, I'm concerned about COVID. You know, I'm fearful because it's rising again. And they're talking about all this thing. And you know what, I'm, I'm fearful about what all's going on in the world right now. And you know what, Pastor, I'm, I, I'm annoyed by those people on, on social media that just get on my nerves. Amen. Well, let me help you fix that. Why don't you just block them today? Right now, actually, block those people that are causing you to lose your peace. Amen. <laughs> You can do that, you know, right? Look at what Paul writes in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. He takes the thought of Isaiah and he puts it in the New Testament. But this is how he writes it, Philippians 4, 8 and 9. He says, and now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. Notice what he says. So when is the God of peace with you? Well, the Bible says in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, when, you, when your mind is fixed on him. You know, I, I often have to fix my mind on God. Amen. I often have to tell myself, God is good. God is good all the time. I often have to remind myself, you know, you know what? God's promises are true. His word never fails. When I'm not sure what to do, I'm reminded he's my guide. When I feel weak, I remind myself God is my strength. When I'm hurting, you know what? He's my comforter. He's my healer. When I'm confused, I said he's the light of my life. He lightens my path. Amen. You know, and sometimes I have to, you know what? In my mind, I have to exhort myself. I have to tell myself, your trust is in God, not in what's going on around you. And I'll tell you what, it keeps me in perfect peace. It'll keep you in perfect peace. Paul, Paul did that often. And Paul writes to the Romans in Romans chapter 8 and verse 35. Let me read to you what he writes. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or are hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? Verse 36, as the scripture says, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, Paul says, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Amen. In other words, we are more than conquerors. One of your translations says, you know what, in Christ Jesus. Look at verse 38. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death or life. Neither angels nor demons. Neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of all hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God. That is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. In other words, Paul says, guys, my mind is fixed on him. What about your minds? And when our minds are fixed on him, he offers us shalom, shalom. It's the peace of God, the perfect peace of God that the world does not understand. That sometimes doesn't even make sense to us. But the world can't find it. The world cannot give it to you. Some people are looking to the White House for peace. Some people are looking to the state capital for peace. You know what? There's only peace in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus Christ, the night that he met with his disciples and established communion, which we'll be taking in a few minutes, he talked to them about a lot of stuff, and he told them that he was about to die, and they, they lost their peace, and they were very fearful, and they were concerned. So he tells them these words in John 14, 27. He says, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives, and because I give you my peace, don't let your hearts be troubled. And don't be afraid. Notice Jesus says, my peace I give to you. He's not just giving you a peace or some peace. He's giving you his peace. And his peace is not found in the absence of problems. His peace is found in the presence of God. Amen. Can I hear a good amen to that? God's reminding yourself in your mind. God is my peace. He is my source. He is my strength. There's a beautiful story in the New Testament that I love. And it's the story of the day Jesus is in the boat with his disciples and they encounter this storm. Let me read it to you in Luke chapter 8, verse 23. It says, as they sailed across, Jesus settled down for a nap. But soon a fierce storm came down on the lake and the boat was filling with water and they were in real danger. The disciples went and they woke him up saying, Master, Master, shouting, notice, Master, Master, we're going to drown. And when Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and the raging waves and suddenly the storm stopped. And all was calm. And then he asked him, where is your faith? The disciples were terrified and amazed. Who is this man 
They asked each other, when he gives a command, even the wind and the waves obey him. So here they are on this boat. And here comes this big storm that all of a sudden shows up. It tells us that the storm was so massive that the disciples began to fear for their lives. And they're thinking, we're not going to make this. We're probably going to die here out in the Galilean Sea. And they did what you and I would do. They started freaking out. You know what? They lost their peace. They got scared to death. And what even bothered them most, you know what bothered them the most? They look over and Jesus is taking a nap. And they're like, what in the world is going on? What do you mean you're taking a nap? You know, I, I have noticed, uh, you know, what's interesting to me that in this life, all of us go through storms, but there's really two storms that are going on in our lives. Like that day, you know, there was a one storm that was visible. There was lightning, there was wind, there were waves. That's the visible storm. But the disciples had a second storm, and it wasn't on the outside, it was on the inside. And I don't know how it is for you, but for, so many, for, for me many times, the storm on the inside is worse than the storm on the outside. Sometimes what's happening outside, I make it worse inside. And sometimes you look at people and you say, well, they're fine. You know, everything's okay. They look good. But you don't know what storm is going on inside of them. You don't know what consumes them. You don't know the fear, the anxiety, the doubt, the worry. You know what? The lack of peace. You know what bothered? You know what was happening with the disciples on that day? You know what was the worst storm? Not the one outside. It was the one inside. It's the one that caused them to cry out, Jesus, don't you even care? Don't you notice we're going to, have you ever told God that? Have you ever thought, you know, God, you're taking a nap. Don't you know what's going on? Why are you not, I'm talking to you. I don't even sense that you hear or care about me. And we lose our peace and we get all out of control. You know, some of you right now, you're in the middle of a storm. And you're doubting God. You're throwing your peace out the window. And you're saying, Lord, I'm praying, I'm waiting, I'm looking, I don't see you. Where are you at? Are you taking a nap? Are you sleeping? But I love the story because Jesus gets up and he walks out there. He probably stretches, you know, and then he speaks. The Bible says, notice he speaks to the storm and he says, storm, peace, be still, calm down. You know what I love about that? You can't speak what you don't have inside. But Jesus, the Prince of Peace, had peace and he spoke to the storm. And he said, peace, calm down. And it calms down. And sometimes the best thing we can do is speak peace to our situation. Declare the word of God. But you can't speak what you don't have. The Bible says he will keep you in perfect peace when your mind is fixed on him. I believe God's word is true. I believe there's a perfect peace that's available. I believe even though during the most difficult circumstances and situations in our life. You know, I have noticed, I'm, I'm like all of you, I, I sometimes have negative, I'm not a very negative person, but sometimes I get negative thoughts. And what I have to do is I have to force those negative thoughts out of my mind and I have to replace them with truth. You know, get rid of those lies, get rid of those fears that want to rob me of, of peace. And I, I have to say things like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know what, my God is blessing me and my coming in and my going out. Those are, those are promises of God. You know what, my heart, you know what, those persons, those people are difficult, but my heart is filled with love of God. And, and the Bible says I should love even those that persecute me, despise me, even my enemies. And God, I'm going to love them with all of my heart. You got to capture those thoughts. You got to capture those negative thoughts and replace them with the truth of God. And when you do that, the Bible says you will experience the peace of God, the shalom, shalom of God. And it's going to be so mind blowing that it's hard to understand. You know, when, when, you, when you speak truth to the lies in your mind, all of a sudden there's a peace and you say, Whoa, what happened? It's, un it's, it's unbelievable. It's beyond our imagination. It's hard to understand. It passes all human understanding. So you might be here today and you say, well, pastor, you don't understand. I, I'm going through a season of, I lost a loved one. I'm in a lot of hurt. I'm physically, I'm in a lot of pain. I'm in a lot of fear. You know what? A, a lot of bad things have happened. And, you know, I know you're talking about peace. But honestly, I, I don't know that peace. And I'm a Christian. Well, Paul writes. He writes to the Philippians in chapter 4. And by the way, Paul writes Philippians while he's in a Roman prison. And he's awaiting trial. And Paul honestly doesn't know whether he will be released or he'll be executed. He has no clue. But when he writes to the church of Philippi, which is a, a, a city in Greece, still there today, he writes these words. He says, be anxious for nothing. Now, if anyone should be anxious, it's him. He doesn't know what's going to happen. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be, known, be made known to God. And I love verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. 
So I want to say to you, whatever is weighing you down, whatever it is that's gripping your heart, don't be anxious about it. Why don't you do what, what God says, pray about everything. You know what, when the doctor's news is good or when the doctor's news is bad, when, when the bank account is high or when the bank account is low, when your marriage is doing well or is in the, you know, in the pits, you know, it's the peace of God. You know, talk to God. It's not the peace of the world. It's not the peace of circumstances. It's the peace of God. I don't have peace because I have a lot of money in the bank or because I have a nice car that works and I, I have a, you know what, my peace and your peace come from the Lord. In other words, it's not things. It's not even the world. And the, because of that, the world can't take it away. You see, because it's not from the world, it can't take it from me. It's from God. It comes from God. So listen to this. Peace isn't the absence of heartache. No, you will have heartache. It's not the absence of loss. You will have loss. It's not the absence of disappointments. You will have disappointments. It's the presence of God. So whatever you're going through right now, fix your thoughts on him and his peace will fill your heart. Peter, thinking about this, he writes in 1 Peter 5.12, he says, cast your cares on him because he cares for you. In other words, Peter reminds us he's with you. And by the way, maybe God is speaking to your heart today. You know, on this Christmas season, Jesus Christ is the greatest gift, the incredible gift. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the giver of peace. And that's why he would say, peace be with you. He would say, go in peace. Paul would say, grace and peace be with you. It's a peace from heaven, and it's available to you. Shalom, shalom. Philippians 4, 7, let me remind you again. May God's peace that passes all understanding guard your hearts and your minds and your souls. If you're here today, is peace possible? Absolutely. Not from this world, not because things are going to get better. It's the presence of God. It's you fixing your thoughts, resting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I hear a good amen to that? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? As every head is bowed and every eye is closed, Father... We ask for peace that comes only from you. And there are people here today, Lord, that need it desperately. And if you're here today and you say, Pastor, I'm one of those, would you slip your hand, just very slightly raise up your hand as I pray for you. Father, I pray for our church family that they would experience from you what only you can give. Peace, shalom, shalom. Lord, peace in the middle of our fears, peace in the middle of our doubts, peace in the middle of our anxiety, peace in the middle of our storms. Lord, peace in the middle of all that life may bring. You know what? Whether it's loss, whether it's sickness. And we thank you, God. We thank you, Lord, that you remind us. The Lord Jesus Christ said we would have trouble. But in the midst of our trouble, we could rejoice and we can take heart. Because he has overcome the world. And because he has overcome, we are more than conquerors. Father, thank you for reminding us that this world is not all there is. One day, there will be no more crying, no more tears, no more brokenness, no more pain, no more sickness. Lord, but in this life, we can begin to experience it, Lord, you said. Your peace, your shalom. So I pray, Father, that your peace would guard our hearts and our minds. May we experience, God, your peace and your goodness. I pray for those right now who are overwhelmed, Lord. And listen, if you're listening to this prayer, I want to, and as every head is bowed and every eye is closed, there's some of you right now who are, who are not sure where you stand with God. And you say, well, I'm sure, I'm definitely not at peace. Or well, you're not at peace because you don't know him. You don't have a relationship with him. The Bible says that you and I are made right by, with God through grace. God in his love, he sent his son Jesus Christ. Never sinned, perfect in every way. He was innocent, perfect, sinless. And he gave his life on the cross for your sins and my sins. The Bible declares that he died in our place. And the Bible says that he was taken down and he was buried. But on the third day he rose from the dead. And he is alive and well today. We declare to you a living Christ, not a dead Christ. And the Bible says that it's not Jesus plus religion. It's not Jesus by your, but your good and your goodness. It's not Jesus and your generosity. No, it's Jesus alone when you open your heart to him that you experience God and the peace of God. Listen, it's about a relationship with the God that loves you. And there's someone here, some of you here today, that you fear, you feel far from God, distant from God. You feel separated from God. I want you to know that you're one prayer, you're one moment away from peace, from forgiveness, from love, from grace. You're one moment away, one prayer away from a God who's reaching out to you, who loves you. The Bible says that when you call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, He'll hear your prayer. He'll forgive your sins. He'll make you a new creation. I want you to know right now that God is reaching out to you. 
He's ready to give you His forgiveness, His peace. He wants you to experience His love. And here's what I want you to do. I want you all out loud to pray with me this prayer. Heavenly Father, forgive all my sins. Jesus, save me and make me new. Fill me with your Spirit so I can follow you. I give you my life. I've made a mess of it. I thank you for the peace that you offer and the forgiveness. I thank you for new life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a hand clap. You know, when you came in, you were given communion. We're going to take communion. And, you know, we take communion the first Sunday of every month. And it's open to all of you. You know, there are some people that say, well, Pastor, I, I don't feel comfortable taking communion because uh, my life doesn't reflect the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, then what I suggest to you is get right with God. Well, Pastor, I, I didn't behave myself this past week. Well, the Bible says that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Why don't you talk to God and say, Lord, mm, I haven't been what you, what I know I need to be and what you want me to be. Instead of letting that keep you from the table of the Lord, why don't you just say, Lord, forgive me? Why don't you utter a prayer, you know, and confess your sin? You don't have to confess to me. You see, that's where we disagree with the, with the Catholic Church. We don't, you don't have to confess to a person. You confess to Him. And you get it right with God. And you say, well, I, I, I don't participate because I don't believe this. Then don't participate because by participating, you say, I believe this. You know, when you participate in communion, you are making a statement that I believe that Jesus Christ died and rose he died for my sins and he rose from the grave and he lives and he's alive and well and he lives in my heart and I honor him through this symbol, through the symbolism, through this ceremony that we call communion. But if you're a Christian, get right with God. Amen. Nothing. God loves you. You see, when we celebrate communion, we, we do several things. But the first thing we do is we remember. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. What do we remember? What he did on the cross. And we remember that he died on the cross. His body was broken. All the shame, all the blame, all the despair. Uh, you know, he was despised. All of the, all of the insults, all that he, all the beatings he went through, he did it for you because that's what you and I deserve for our sins. The reason why you and I will not get that is because Jesus took it for us. But we deserve that. We deserve all that punishment. See, on the cross, he, he shed his blood for us. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. Every time we take communion, we are preaching a sermon. You're helping me preach a sermon. Christ died on the cross. His body was broken for me, for my salvation. And I thank God that He found me when I was lost. And I'm a child of God. Not because I earned it or I deserved it or some way I can pay it back. I have it because of what He did. He did it all. I only surrendered and I said, Lord, I thank you and I accept it. That's what we're saying. But the other thing we're saying is not only what He did, but why He did it. Because He loves us. You see, there's a lot of voices that will come into your, and you're not schizophrenic, but there's a lot of voices that will come and say, you're not worthy to be loved by God. The devil will come and say, he doesn't love you. You're a mess. You've messed up too many times. You know what? You've blown it. He's tired of you. You know how moms and dads get tired of their kids? God, our, your father's gotten tired of you. And, and there comes a point where we believe he doesn't love me anymore. Well, I want you to know that's a lie. He loves you. He loved you. Before you were a sinner, He loves you now that you're a Christian. What He did on the cross took care of your past sins, your present sins, and your future sins, but we must confess them to Him. You know why we do it? We remember the why. He loves me. Maybe you're here today and you have forgotten that He loves you. And you have forgotten that you matter to Him. And you have forgotten that you're very special. And you have forgotten that there's nothing that you could ever do that will separate you from the love of God. You've forgotten that the peace of God is yours despite you and what you've gone through and your mess. And today he calls you back home. And every time we take communion, that's what we're remembering. That's what we're celebrating. So the Apostle Paul, he writes to the church of Corinth and he writes these words. He said, For I received from the Lord that which I delivered unto you, that in the night in which he was betrayed, after having given thanks, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. The bread, the body of Christ. Let's take it together.
And Paul continues and he says, And after they had taken the bread, Jesus got up, looked at his disciples, and took the cup, and he said, This is the new covenant in my blood. Drink it and do it in remembrance of me until I come again. You know why we do this? We do it in remembrance of what Christ did. And we do it until he comes. The Bible speaks of a day when he will come back. He will return a second time for his church, for his people. And until that time, we, we celebrate communion, remembering that he is not only alive and well in our midst, but one day he's coming back for us. Take the wine, symbol of the blood of Jesus Christ. Let's take it together. Why don't you take a moment right there in your own heart and talk to God. And why don't you tell him how grateful you are for one day touching your heart and finding you. You know, as I think back, I realize that uh, I didn't find God. God wasn't lost. He found me. I was lost. And I realized that that day on March 31st, 1973, I could have said no. I could have said, Lord, I'm not interested. I don't care what I feel. I don't care what I understand. I don't care what I think right at this moment. I don't want you. I could have done that. Some of you have done that. But I thank God that he gave me the ability to say yes. Not, not really sure what I was saying yes to, except that I wanted to serve God. I wanted to honor him as a 16-year-old boy. And 50 years later, I, I look back, and it blows my mind, not only for what he's done, but what he, what he continues to do. I remember telling him, Lord, I want to serve you, but I don't know, I don't know whether I can do this. I don't know whether this is possible, but if you help me, Lord, I'll give you my youth. I'll give you my life. And Lord, I don't have anything to give to you right now because I was a junior in high school. But whatever you allow my life to become, it's going to be yours. And I will honor you. And for 50 years, God has been faithful. It hasn't been without its battles, without its, with the, without its downs and you know ups and downs. But he is faithful. The peace of God has filled my heart as I stay fixed on him and as I lean on him. So, Father, we thank you today for your great love. Our lives are different. Lord, we're not the same. We're not perfect. But, Lord, I'm not what I was last year or two years ago. Or definitely not what I was 50 years ago. And we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. And, Father, I'm reminded this morning that on the cross you died for our sins. But there on the cross the word says that you died for our infirmities, our spiritual sickness, but our, spiritual, our, our physical sickness. Right now, in the name of Jesus Christ, I know you're a powerful God. And you're the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And you're in our midst. I pray that your healing touch would flow. And you would touch those that are either online watching or those that are here. Lord, whatever it is that's going on in their bodies. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, we speak wellness and healing. We speak, Lord, your presence upon that life. And Lord, we know that you do miracles. And nothing is too hard for you. I got to confess, I don't understand how that works. I don't understand, Lord, everything. I just know that according to our faith, it will be done. I just know that we pray for them, and God, you are the healer. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? As you stand, would you give the Lord the biggest applause? Hallelujah. Amen. Cheer, whatever you want to call it. Amen. Listen, we'll see you in the month of December as we continue the missing piece. I want to bless you. My desire is that the Lord would bless you and keep you. May he, make it, may he make his face shine upon you. May you experience his peace, his love, his goodness, his joy, and, his, and everything that he offers. I pray that you would go here and you would speak God's peace and God's blessing and God's favor upon your life, even when it's probably not what you want it to be, and see what God will do. We love you. We'll see you Wednesday at 7.15 in person. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your day. God bless.